Good, good morning, everyone. The Committee on Early Learning, Juvenile Justice, Public Education, and First Generation Initiatives is now called to order. Today is Friday, November 4, 2016, and it's 9.01 a.m. The only thing that we have on the agenda this morning is a confirmation hearing for the appointment of Mr. Mark Mendiola to the Guam Education Board as a parent uh, representative. Notices for this public hearing were disseminated via email to all centers and all main media broadcasting outlets on October 27, 2016 to meet the five-day notice and again on November 1st to meet the 48-hour notice. I would like to acknowledge um, uh, our speaker, uh, speaker of the legislature, um, Speaker Judy Wanpat, who is also the vice chair for this committee. And to my right, I have Senator um, Mary Torres and our vice speaker, B.J. Cruz. Thank you very much for attending. I would like to call up uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Mendiola, please. Okay, so please state your name and you can start with your testimony. Today, Chairperson of Public Education, Dr. Narissa Underwood, Speaker Wampat, Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz, Senator Morrison, Senator Torres. My name is Mark Benny Cruz Mendiola, Familian Leeds and Familian Thunder. I'm married to the lovely Jennifer Carlson Mendiola, who is a math teacher at Teason High School. And we have five wonderful boys, Josiah Mark, Zachary Robert, Benjamin Anthony, Micah Lee, and he must but see Elijah Jerome. Four of my children attend two of the finest public schools on Guam, respectively, Agatha Johnson Middle School and Order Chalampago Elementary School. Also with me, I have my siblings, my brother Paul Mendiola, my sister Gail Mendiola, and my brother-in-law, Matt Manabusen, with me here today, and my first cousin, Karina Duenas Rivera. You know, every morning um, when I say my prayers, I thank the good Lord above for blessing me with a loving and supportive wife and the five children that he's entrusted me with their upbringing. I come before this legislative body to seek your support and vote of confidence in becoming a member of the Guam Public School Education Policy Board as the parent representative. When I was approached about considering the call to serve on the board, I paused for a moment and I reflected on my educational journey as a child and into adulthood. As a young student, I struggled academically. This struggle led me to be retained a grade level. Despite my struggles, it took the love and support and courage of my parents, Benny Flores Mendiola and Martha Cruz Mendiola, that I was able to achieve my go educational goals and graduate from high school. Furthermore, along my educational journey, I was blessed to have the support of great teachers and mentors because of their patience and understanding, and I mean a lot of patience. I was able to become a first generation college graduate, which opened many doors in my professional career. I know as a parent, I have a bigger and more important role in ensuring my children receive the best education possible so I can build upon the legacy my parents and my teachers, teachers have instilled in me. Despite my busy schedule, I continue to remain active in my children's educational journey, and I have volunteered my time in helping at schools, at the schools they attend. In fact, I am the current president of the Agatha Johnson Middle School Parent Teacher Organization, and I was the president, the past president of the Aganya Heights Elementary School Parent Teacher Organization. 
I want to reassure you, Senators, that I will carry the same commitment and drive as a member of the board representing all students and parents. You know, I'm grateful. I am grateful for the thousands of employees of our Department of Education that wake up every morning to greet our 30,000 plus students ready to educate our future generation. Despite the current challenges, they are doing their best to provide our children with the best learning environment. I look forward to working with all stakeholders of our school system, especially our current board members. I understand our role as board members is prescribed by law and our primary function is to develop po sound policies and ensure that the superintendent is supervised and supported properly and that the policies that we adopt and Im are implemented and carried out effectively. I close my testimony with a quote from the late former Senator Angel Santos. At times we may fail, at times we may make mistakes, but we must never make the mistake of failing to try. People deserve nothing less. And in this case, Senators, our children deserve nothing less than the best education, and I'm willing to try and do my best to make that possible. Who agradeces tine oportunidad, ha na izu i gabetnu para beyu set bi studenteta, ho gogogo hamzu i menirop lina senador, na un considera zu, zan na izu i tsensoku, para beyu set bi i studenteta lokwi. Un danku lina studenteta zu smasi. Thank you very much, um, Mark. That certainly was, uh, you had provided more information about yourself uh, that really, uh, again, highlights and underscores your qualification and your commitment to education. You, in reviewing your packet, you had also have had the experience of being um, uh, the student rep for the University of Guam uh, Board of Regents, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and so you also have that policy-making, decision-making um, experience. And I have to disclose that you and I have known each other for a number of years, but you've known my husband a lot longer. Yes, ma'am. And I have known you to be one who's really committed. You um, have been very supportive in many ways, in personal ways, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but we are here today to address your appointment to a very, very important uh, position. And especially at a time like this, mm -hmm. uh, when there are a lot of issues that are still hanging um, with the Department of Education leadership. So um, I had provided you with a list of questions that I was going to ask you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but there may be additional questions that my colleagues may have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll go ahead and begin uh, by, of course, congratulating you and thanking you for accepting uh, the nomination and the appointment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, Mark, during our conversation regarding your nomination the other day, <coughs> um, you had stated that you are committed to doing your best and your primary goal is to be of service to our DOE students and educators, among whom are your children and uh, who, who go to school, as you had noted, and also your wife, who is a teacher. Over the past couple of months, DOE reported that the reimbursement for utilities promised by FASTBAC coordinators have not been paid and given your role as one of those FESPAC coordinators who work directly with DOE and the fact that lack of reimbursement to date, questions may be raised about your commitment to our students and doing your very best to putting our students and, and teachers first. So what do you have to say about this situation? Thank you for that question, uh, Senator. Um, you know, I, I uh, strongly believe that, uh, you know, the FESPAC, uh, FESPAC was a great event and it was a great partnership between the Department of Education and, and the government of Guam. And there were a lot of agencies that came out in support of FES, the Festival of the Pacific Arts. I was the, I was the chair of the um, housing committee. And I reassure you that uh, we had the support of the super superintendent, John Fernandez, along with uh, the deputy superintendents. 
um, Mr. Joe Sanchez, who's now the acting superintendent. We also had Chris Anderson, who was a, uh, a superintendent, and Erica Cruz. And in anticipation of our guests arriving, uh, the FESPAC committee also made uh, a lot of investments in improving the school uh, facilities prior to their arrival. Um, we were able to invest money into fixing the, uh, and upgrading the electrical situation at some of the schools. We were able to um, fix some of the shower facilities at some of the schools. We were able to provide uh, services for uh, maintenance and cleaning. And the one question that, that's, uh, that has been posed was about uh, the utilities um, that uh, was used uh, during FESPAC. I can say this much, uh, Senator, that I have been in consultation with uh, the leadership of the Department of Education, and we have, po we have posed some questions regarding uh, the billing, and we are working that out, and we believe that we'll come to a solution before the end of this month, and that uh, we'll properly pay what is due to the Department of Education. So, th so what was quoted was, I believe, around 300,000 uh, that was quoted by by the Department of Education, yes. or was it a little bit more? Yes, and what we found out, uh, uh, Madam Senator, was that uh, we, there was about 41 schools in the public school system, and we u utilized eight schools, mm -hmm. and on a monthly basis, the power consumption for the schools was about a million dollars, and for the eight schools that we were utilizing over a three-week period was one-fourth of that. Mm -hmm. And so I, we did work with the administration to isolate the areas that we utilized at some of the schools, and uh, we're working out the, the details and to properly account for um, all the charges that we will incur for FESPAC. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I fully understand the need for us to be accountable and to ensure that we, we, um, we don't overbill or we don't underbill. Right. But we, we, that we, but, but I also know that, you know this, Mark, that DOE is constantly struggling with funds and that the release of cash sometimes may be delayed because we're just short of cash, right, all around. Mm -hmm. We know that. That's a fact. So whether it's 300000 30000 or 3000 it can make that much of a difference to our students or our teachers. Our teachers, as you know, your wife would know this, that she has to purchase a lot of her supplies and materials. So the concern that had been raised about this is really the timeliness mm -hmm. of the reimbursement to the Department of Education. Yeah. So I thank you that you are right now stating that by the end of November, they could perhaps see the reimbursement yes, in some form. Yes, ma'am. And I will assume that you're going to fight very hard to ensure that they get reimbursed to the extent that they really should be reimbursed, even if it's more than what it was that they had mm -hmm. uh, billed FESPAC. Yes, ma'am. As part of the, as the chairperson of the Housing Committee, it, it's always been a priority. And I believe that the deputy superintendents can attest that I've been in constant communication with them, and we will come to a solution uh, and, and address the issue and make the department whole. Okay, Thank so you. they'll have a good um, Christmas with the reimbursement. Yes. Thank you. Um, during our conversation, you also noted that you had spent a lot of time studying Title IX. Uh, because that seems to be the federal law that's been spoken about over the past three months. And the following was obtained from the U.S. DOE website that addresses Title IX. I'll just read it. Title IX applies to institutions that receive federal financial assistance from the Education Department, including state and local educational agencies. These agencies include approximately 16,500 local school districts and 7,000 post-secondary institutions, as well as charter schools, for-profit schools, libraries, and museums. Also included are vocational rehab 
rehabilitation agencies and education agencies of 50 states, the District of Columbia, and territories and possessions of the United States. Educational programs and activities that receive edu um, education department ad funds must operate in non-discriminatory manner. Some key issues, areas in which recipients have Title IX obligations are recruitment, admissions, and counseling, financial assistance, athletics, sex-based harass harassment, treatment of pregnant and parenting students, discipline, single-sex education, and employment. Also, a recipient <laughs> may not retaliate against any person for opposing an unlawful educational practice or policy or made charges, testified, or participated in any complaint action under Title IX. For a recipient to retaliate in any way is considered a violation of Title IX. And the um, uh, Ed Title IX regulations, um, that's Volume 4, Code of uh, Federal Regulations, Part 106, provide additional information for that. Based on your understanding of the foregoing, what are the two primary purposes of Title IX? Uh, Senator, you know that that uh, you know I understand that 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 it is a law, um, and one of the reasons why I actually started reading into Title IX before I was even considered to be appointed here was because I have a son with special needs, mm -hmm. and I I pose a question to his team that, um, you know, what's at stake uh, if Title IX uh, was violated? And they basically told me that, you know, the services my son receives, bus transportation, speech services, his one-to-one -one aid, and as a parent, that really concerned me. Mm -hmm. I understand that this, this uh, law is very complex in, in that uh, there are processes that have to be followed, but as a parent representative on the board, I'm well aware that the, the public school system, um, you advised me to reach out to the chairwoman, which I did, uh, and she shared with me that they are in the process of doing, uh, uh, coming up with, with sound policy, and I want to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, uh, she had mentioned to me that there is a process for uh, an opportunity to get, uh, go through an orientation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't claim to know everything about Title IX. I understand that uh, may be a little bit more complex than what I read as a layperson and not as a, a lawyer, but uh, I do understand what's at stake for my son should uh, Title IX be violated. So, um, so with Title IX, the primary purpose there is actually to provide a mechanism, right, mm -hmm. for our, for students or even employees to make a complaint. Should there be uh, discrimination based on gender, or even that includes sexual harassment mm -hmm. or um, sexual misconduct, so that there is a process that needs to be to be followed? Yes. And you did read that in yes, your study. Yes, 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 I did. Right. But as it pertains to um, you know the Department of Education, as I mentioned, um, I look forward to that orientation to find out what processes are in place. Mm -hmm. and how I can contribute to that, that conversation as a parent who is actually using some of those services and that those services may be in jeopardy. And so I just want to ensure that, uh, that we follow our processes. Right. So, so part of that process, again, just to refresh your memory of what you had uh, studied, is that once a complaint is made, there would have to be action that's taken by the department, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and you do agree with that. Mm -hmm. That was your recollection of your study mm -hmm. of Title IX. Yep. And that right after that, there would have to be an investigation. Yes, ma'am. Right, and, and that that investigation has to be objective and fair, yes. not only to the student or the person that is making the allegation or the complaint, but also to the one who's allegedly accused. I so there are protections for both parties, yes. correct? You yes. did get that? Yes, I did. Yes. Okay, so as late as yesterday, uh, there was another complaint that was made. 
uh, and it came from, uh, I'm not sure if she's still a student, but a 20-year-old young lady against one of the administrators. Are you aware of that complaint? Yes, I, I read through the media sources that there is a complaint. Mm -hmm. So if, if you were a member of the Guam Education Board, and based on what you already know about Title IX, what steps would need to be taken immediately? You know, I, at, at this time, I, I defer to respond to um, that line of questioning because I do know that uh, there are tremendous amount of uh, issues surrounding that. And um, I do know that if I'm confirmed, I would like to look at all the information that's presented to the board and I will vote my conscience based on what I know to be true. And um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. I actually, I'm not asking you, Mr. Mendiola, to make a decision. <laughs> I'm just asking about what would be the key steps that you would need to take as a board member, knowing what you already know about Title IX. Well, I appreciate you highlighted the process for me, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the members of the board are, um, are aware, and I, I'm one of the board members, and we have to work as a cohesive unit, and I understand my role that uh, I represent the parents, and I will give input as a parent as to how we address these uh, issues. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. One of the concerns that has been raised um, given your nomination has to do with your capacity, uh, Mr. Mandiola, to think and act independently given the following. So the first one is that we understand that you are an unclassified employee of GIDA at mm -hmm. this point. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Will this have any bearing on the decisions that you make as a board member? I don't think so. Um, and the reason being is that uh, when I sit on the board, and you had mentioned earlier that I uh, sat on a governing board before, um, I have experienced um, receiving many opinions from many folks on certain issues. And, um, you know, I made my decisions based on that. And I voted my conscience on it. Um, I'm pleased with the decisions I've made. Um, and I'm, glad, I'm grateful that I have uh, an employment opportunity uh, to work and learn and professionally grow using the skill sets that I attained at the University of Guam. And so um, with that, uh, I just have to say that, uh, you know, when it comes to my decision-making processes, I will take into consideration uh, input from senators, stakeholders, the governor, and of course my fellow colleagues, and I will take it for what it is and make my decision based on what I feel is the best interest of the students. So there were three members of the Guam Education Board who were appointed by the governor. When the three members were voted, um, the three members voted to terminate the employment contract of Mr. Fernandez, the governor asked for their resignation. What would you say to those who have concerns about your capacity to put the welfare of the students uh, at the center of a decision-making process that may involve the termination of a superintendent of education? Yeah. You know, the governor made, uh, made that call. It's his prerogative. Uh, he's the uh, appointing authority to the Board of Education. And I understand that uh, I do know, uh, Madam Senator, that if controversial issues do become before me and topics that are uh, hotly contested, I know that I am capable of making the tough decisions that I need to make to, um, to move things forward. Uh, I stand on my principle. I, I, I would vote my conscience. And um, I will basically stand by those decisions. So, so, Again, specifically, if your decision is contrary to that of the governor and what the governor has stated publicly, and you are asked to resign, would you resign? You know, with all due respect, the governor hasn't asked me to resign. He's actually appointing me. 
and uh, I would like to afford the opportunity to get in there and to do the work necessary to get things done and to help my colleagues on the board move things forward. And it's his prerogative as the governor of Guam to make that call, and I would leave it to him to make that decision. And you would resign even if you you have made a decision that was based on your your critical analysis of the of of the situation pertaining to our students. Senator, I believe I, I answered the question to the best of my ability, and if that ever arises, it may be a, a unique situation. I, I don't know. I can't predict the future, but I do know mm -hmm. he's appointing me, and in my discussion with him, he asked me to follow our policies and to be transparent about it, and that's what I intend to do. And in the future, whatever it may hold, uh, and I make a decision, um, I'll be able to justify the position I take. Well, there are a couple of reasons why, of course, that I had asked you that. One of the concerns that had been raised by the public has to do with the stability of the leadership. Leadership is not just the superintendent of education. It involves the Guam Education Board as well. Mm -hmm. You understand that, right? Yes. So to the extent <coughs> that there is that concern about the stability of the leadership, then the concern had been that if about your capacity to make decisions that really is based on your role as a parent rep, your role as the father of five children, four of which are going to school, and balancing that with the appointing authority. In fact, one of the questions that was raised to me was, well, what does this mean now? Given that the three were, were asked to resign after they made a decision that the governor did not agree with, does this mean that uh, Mr. Mendiola would have to check with the governor on what decision he has to make before he makes the decision? So you understand the concern that may yeah, have that, been raised. And right? that's a valid concern, Senator. Yes. And I believe that uh, I know in my heart that I will make the decision based on what I know to be true. Mm -hmm. And I would keep in mind the ch my children, but also the 30,000 children that go to school when I make those decisions. Mm -hmm. I will stand by those decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like, um, Madam Vice Chair, would you like to? Thank you very much. Um, well, she asked, actually asked us some of the questions I wanted to ask, but I'd just like to, to reiterate them, and they're very, very simple. Um, I've, I do have you know, some concerns being a, a, an educator myself, and being a school principal you know, for, for many years, is that the bottom line would be is where uh, will your loyalty lie? My loyalty lie with the children, ma'am. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the governor's uh, faith in me that I that I will make the right decisions, and I believe that uh, he thought about my appointment and realized that I have the capacity to make tough decisions. But I also believe that uh, he respect he will respect my decisions, uh, especially representing the parents uh, on this board. And. You know, normally everyone, of course, have a different process of uh, making decisions. How will you, before you make a decision, what are some of the things that, or processes that you would have, that you go through to make any kind of a decision? Well, you know, it's kind of like the uh, universities, Inina, Enlighten, you know, Discover, and to Serve. And so, of course, I would try and gather all the information I understand that there's experts, subject matter, ex subject matter experts that know more. Uh, I understand that I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And it's a wel welcoming uh, um, feeling that uh, the board members that are currently sitting on the board are, have been willing to w invite me in to, to learn and to um, grow uh, into being a, an effective board member. So I'm up to the challenge. Um, and if these issues come before me, uh, rest assured that uh, I will base my decision on what is before me, and I will make that decision whether um, it is controversial or non-controversial, -con and if my decision is unpopular, I will vote my conscience. And, 
excuse me. The one thing that uh, also concerns me is and individuals in either upper management or even as a policymaker, that they do not push, you know, for their personal agenda, which would end up not benefiting the children, but rather, of course, um, whatever um, additional costs that you know the the department will be faced with. And I just want to make sure that that you're not going in with any personal agenda and that you're, like you said earlier, is that it will be always for the children in mind. And my agenda right now, ma'am, my children and the children that we're serving in our public school system. Uh, and I do know um, for a fact that, uh, you know, there's gonna be some tough decisions that we're gonna have to make. And I will base it on what I believe to be true and what I believe to be fact. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now I will disclose as well is that I, uh, I know Mr. Mendiola for, for many years and uh, you are a friend and I'm not afraid to say that publicly and I'm Thank you. also going to say is that based on your background, based on your testimony, is that you have my vote. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Sister Smasi. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Mendiola. Well, actually, I was, I was disappointed. Uh, we met the other day, and we had a very extensive discussion, especially about Title IX. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I was hoping that in your testimony, uh, rather than all the personal background that you, you provided in the testimony, that you would have addressed some of the issues that were in the questions that were... Because as I mentioned to you, if you don't mention it in your yes. in your testimony, I will ask the questions yes. about the the compliance with Title with Title Nine. And um, I mentioned to you that um, the protection of children is the core of my existence. I mean, it's as Senator Tina would put it, it's in my heart. Yes. Um, and this fiscal conservatism is a newfound. Um, concern that I have. Um, the question that was posed to you by Chairman Underwood about with your information, with the reading th that you've had uh, uh, on Title IX, what do you believe ought to be done with the current situation, or th the one that was announced yesterday? Um, I think she was just asking for what procedures do you believe to have to be in in place? Mm -hmm. Having read Title IX, what procedures need to be met? Um, like in our discussion about the fact that maybe there needs to be an assignment of a full-time Title IX EEOC person at DOE and the discussion of whether or not it should be should or should not be a a HR person or whether it should be a lawyer, um, but it, she was just asking about the process and the procedure. I I don't think either one of us in our discussions, even with you, wanted to know what your vote would have been in either. Was with your knowledge and your reading of Title IX, what processes? do you believe ought to be in place um, at the Department of Education? Not talking about the, the facts of, the, of this, uh, any allegation, but what processes should be in place to address any allegation that comes forward today, yesterday, or three months ago? Thank you, Senator, and I appreciate, do appreciate the time that you uh, spent with me in discussing this issue. After I left your office, I also visited and I communicated with some of the centers, and they sh share the same sentiment. And I was advised to also seek out, you know, what has been done currently on the board. And um, what I've come to realize, there are a lot of things that's already in motion, and I wanted to be able to go and see what has been done to date. I do believe you um, transmitted a letter a couple months ago uh, 
mentioning, you know, that it's your core that you want these policies and procedures to be put in place. I know that the University of Guam and GCC has done that, and I believe that uh, if I'm appointed to um, the Board of Education, or if I'm confirmed to the Board of Education, that I will look into how we can understand that policy and those processes and have the stakeholders give the input based on what is law and what ought to be done. Um, I cannot second guess how far where they have gone so far uh, with the board in terms of this process, but I would definitely, uh, when I get on the board, would like to be a part of that discussion and move this process along so that we can put it as a policy and share that with the community. Again, I'm not asking what you think that they ought to be, um, what the decision ought to be. I'm just saying, what, what do you believe the procedures and the process ought to be already? That there should be this, uh, like in, in the case of a child with special needs. Mm -hmm. You know that, this, that, the, that the, the department is responsible for having an IEP, having an IE team, having a appeals process, all those kinds of things. Even without having any involvement in it, what processes do you believe or procedures do you believe the department ought to already have in place because of Title IX, already in place uh, since Title IX God, I think, is, was enacted in the 90s. That it, he, this, you know, this being November 2016, what sh procedures should have already been in place? What kind of personnel should be in, have been employed for certain things? What, just without addressing any specific case, just what procedure do you believe your reading of Title IX requires the Department of Education to al already have had in place. I have a lot to learn, Senator, about Title IX, and I believe that the, the policies that mm -hmm. need to be in place is that if there is an accusation or uh, any issue that comes before the board, that it is properly uh, handled. And that By whom? If it's, in what way? If it's a personnel, uh, personnel issue, it should be the superintendent that deals with the processes handling personnel. When it comes to the, the uh, supervision of the superintendent, it'll be the board that makes that uh, decision. Okay, I mean, it's, it's just that it was those responses. I didn't want to have to keep pulling, <laughs> pulling teeth to try to get the answer. It's just that there, there should be, and there should be a process in place. And the reason why today, actually, my, my core concern for children and my fiscal conservatism uh, meet up just coincidentally, almost serendipitously, within the last eight hours, the U.S. Department of Education levied a $2.5 million fine, $2.5 million fine against the University of Pennsylvania for its failure to comply with the Cleary Act. And in the findings by the U.S. Department of Education that it, it sent out this morning, well, this morning our time, but it would have been East Coast time, <clears throat> probably in the last six hours, it sets a specific amount for each failure of them to not naming someone. Um, lack of administrative capability was a $27,000 uh, $27, fine. Omitting in or inadequate security costs was a fine for this amount. It's, and the largest one, failure to properly classify reported incidents and incidences, incidents and disclose crime statistics from 2008 to 11, the proposed fine was $2,167,000. Um, and when, what scares me is we know that there was a settlement just recently in, US, in GDOE of $80,000 for a assignment of a, of, a, of a teacher in violation of, of ADA. And that was $80,000 for, for, for that violation of them not following. 
you barely have enough, DOE barely has enough money to pay for its utilities and is owed 300000 by FESPAC. It, it, there isn't enough money to be paying fines. Um, in fact, my staff has advised me against what I usually do. I would have foyered a number of the agencies to find out how much the government of Guam has already paid in fines for noncompliance just to see how much we're losing. But I've been told you may not want to know. But after I see that USDOE sent out, the, levied 2.5 million against University of Pennsylvania for what they did and what the administration failed to do and how they treated the everybody that was reporting um, I have to be concerned not only because of my concerns for the children but because of my concern of the budgetary um, implications of having to pay fines I mean 2.8 million dollars I'd much rather be spent somewhere else and, and as we discussed I wouldn't want USDOE to have us under another this time not a financial management but a, but an e, uh, title IX management and naming a team of lawyers that we have to pay for at USDOE to I mean a GDOE to, to oversee our op our so I'm, I'm trying to get I'm hoping that everybody that's going to be named to the DOE board understands what the implications of some of their actions were. Are. I mean, at the oversight hearing, the board was sitting right here. And I see um, Mr. Mr. Addy here. When when I railed on on the, what they did and how that would be seen as retaliatory and the implications of that. And so I'm, I'm really concerned about not only the cost, the wasted fine money, but I am concerned ab about the protection of the students and the protection of all the employees from any kind of sexual harassment uh, and students in, in, in the Department of Education. So I really hope that before we take a vote at some point that uh, you will read some more and uh, come back to me and assure me that you understand what the process is. Um, that I'm hoping that you would be able to go on to the board and explain to the rest of the board what Title IX requires. If that's what I ex was hoping. I mean, I thought that's was the, what I came out of our conversation in the office was that I, I wanted to he see and hear that and I wanted you to make the commitment in your initial statement not being pulled out by a question by the chair um, that I will vote my conscience that I will do what what I believe is is right um, and uh, because I asked you the same question as an unclassified employee you may have made really excellent decisions as, as, as a student regent but at the time you didn't have five children that you had to that you had to fend for and with an unclassified position no protection by the classified by, by the classified system would that impact your your decision um, you assured me it wouldn't but I'm just saying it was a fair question by the chair because um, there is no protection um, and um, I, we're, we're just concerned about how how we move forward and those two the, the documents that I provided you you're the only board member that has seen it the only other person that has seen it has been the previous uh, superintendent um, <clears throat> But I made no splash about it. I just, I just wanted it done, and I want you to know that this has been something that I've been discussing with DOE management since March, and I'm not only disappointed, I'm dismayed. I you cannot even fathom the depths of my anger 
that it's still not in place at DOE. And then to find out that the time that I came and appeared before the board in May, they were having all this happening in the background. Uh, when I came to the board it, it, against uh, uh, the superintendent's wishes because he said, you know, I'm busy with FESPAC, I'll get around to it. And I went to the board and I said, I want this policy implemented before the school opens. And now it's November and it's still not done. I, I really, really hope that if you are confirmed onto the board that um, you will make sure that it, it is a top priority and there should be a process in the same way that there is a process and a procedure and an SOP uh, the, for students with, with, with disabilities that there has to be a process that's in writing at, at uh, GDOE to address this very serious issue because it could cost us money. and the destruction, but more importantly, it will save us the destruction of many lives. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Speaker. Mr. Mignola, Malik, Namanali, Niga. Lo, kalaluhan to Papakuna un aluk na lu na sito ang kinsiryal ang gin ang gin guha la la cita gitayro nine sinama mat tulitati salapit sa sempitad sa sabiso para ilahimo and I think we what concerns me is is a lot of times we we wish that situations aren't the way they are and we would do anything to pull something back so that we don't have to pay the consequences. And I, I trust uhongi na sincero hao. Unga na uhongi na sincero hao. Za utungu na malati hao, na studia hao, za malati hao. Za maole ki tse tsot mugi universidad. Uhongi ano. But the only thing that I would ask you is please, um, a lot of times when we are in a very difficult situation where the truth hurts, hurts us and can hurt us um, that we that we still go down that we still go down that troubled path you know and that's the only thing that I would um, ask you and we talked a little bit about it yesterday about about doing the right thing about being principled about you and I, I think personally suffered consequences of being principled at some point in our career um, and but I think it's necessary, though, and, and it will alleviate a lot of the concerns in the public because nobody, nobody at this point in our history appreciates a tentago. And I know that you don't see yourself as a tentago. That's the sense I'm getting from you, and, and, and I respect that. Uh, but, but, you know, we also want assurances that the people that are going to go in to replace those who were called to resign will look at the issue for what it is because there's a right and a wrong and as much as we don't want to suffer the consequences of wrong if in fact there is wrong we we owe it we we have to go with the system right we have that that's that's a judicial system we pay for whatever mistakes we make and um that is what you were saying to me yesterday right that you're willing to keep an open mind understanding that decisions that you in collaboration with the board could could directly harm you your son your family but you're still willing to make those hard decisions is that what yes ma'am okay thank you because mark you know mapurastitsa tota no lo lo tunguna ngin ngin go responsibility dar nisita un sogwi uh half a no nisita un sogwi sangin ngin Lalalo uno or the Maguiza or the Mapreba Hafa Ibidadan Moon, Sita, and Continua, Zona Bansa Mortna, Sangin Angin Segura Hap, Pesabansa Mortna, no? 
כן. אוקיי, סיזוס מעשי. סיזוס מעשי. Thank you, Senator Torres. Uh, yes. Okay, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, good morning, uh, Mr. Mendiola, and uh, welcome to your family and uh, all those that are here to uh, participate in this process. Um, certainly, my, my colleagues have some really um, uh, uh, great concerns here and that uh, makes the case or maybe a segue into an oversight hearing or to the least extent an information hearing because as you stated earlier um, there's a lot of of research that you need to do into title nine uh, you have a lot of learning to still take place I think I think what we're seeing out there with the bits and pieces coming uh, from our media is is that there's a lot of people that still need to learn what's going on in title nine So certainly I, I thank you for raising that and saying that you, being honest, that you still need to learn more. Um, I want to thank you for accepting a nomination during these challenging times. And I attended many uh, courses with you at the University of Guam. I know you personally, Mark, I know your family uh, personally. Um, I watched you succeed in everything you've touched And, and participated in, in any capacity in this government, and even in nonprofit organizations. So I, I know where your heart's at, and I know that uh, 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 with some sort of um, roundtable discussions with your colleagues and the board, um, that we can get to the bottom of a lot of the questions that are being brought up here. Um, I and mean, certainly you're in here for a confirmation hearing and being uh, grilled with questions that a lot of other folks need to answer to. So I, I appreciate your, your openness and candor on these issues. Um, I look forward to working with you and addressing the challenges uh, with the Department of Education. I look forward to supporting an, your confirmation. And again, I congratulate you for taking on the challenge. Thank you, Senator. Senator Adam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Mendiola, good morning. Good morning, uh, Good morning sir. to your family and your children, your, uh, your wife. Um, yeah, for a second there, I thought we, uh, we were having our oversight hearing here for uh, DOE. The, uh, <laughs> wow. And you're not even confirmed to the board yet. <laughs> um, you know, it's very interesting that, uh, and I hope that this goes back to um, the oversight hearing. And maybe it, it's something that needs to be done and find out where the board is at with Title IX, whether all members are well-versed with Title IX that they should be, as the questions that were posed to you. And not only the board, but I think also the uh, acting superintendent and the, uh, the deputy superintendents. Uh, the, this is very important. Um, this question has been lingering and it goes back months. Uh, you were not even on the board. Um, You were expected to, to hypothetically give a, an answer as to what, what, where, or where you stand and what you would be thinking of. And uh, I think all these, these things should have been in place already. Um, DOE is not new. Uh, it's, it's been around for as long as government has been around. So the issue of Title IX is not a new issue. Uh, the questions that were posed to you were... Uh, questions that could have been answered 10, 15, 20 years ago. Do we have policies in place for it? Do we have the, the answers that need to be answered for it? Does the uh, board and the superintendent and the, the deputies have the, the knowledge, the in-depth knowledge that this committee expects for them to have that the questions that were posed to you? I think they should all. I think everyone should have those, uh, those answers, especially when it's the vice speaker says, what is it costing? You know, what is it costing the government in Title IX violations? And I think for you to know that answer, I think is, you can look into it, but I think the current board and the current uh, leadership of DOE should know that answer today. 
and had this been an oversight hearing, I would have been more than happy to ask the rest of the board members to come up and the acting superintendent, because I see that the majority of them are here, the school leadership, to answer the questions that were posed to you. Uh, I look forward to voting on your confirmation. You have my full support to put yourself before this committee, knowing what you're facing. Um, <clears throat> didn't deter you you sit you 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 uh, sat there and your your temperament was just I, I watched you the whole time yes madam chair no senator yes senator your your temperament is just remarkable you know we, we've seen many individuals that come before this committee or come before this body and um, it's not like that and I see why a lot of people refuse to sit on boards and commissions is because the way this body treats those who come before this body. You know, it's, you don't have to do it. <laughs> you're comfortable where you're at, but you do it because your children right there, your wife's right there. So for you to go through the, the line of questioning that you did, was it necessary? Maybe in some of the, the members' minds it was. But I think that's questions that could have been answered by the board as a whole, not just one individual member, because not one individual member makes a decision. You know? And that's something that the whole leadership of the Department of Education should be able to answer also. So I look forward to, to working with you. I look forward to uh, voting on your confirmation. You have my full support, and uh, I hope that uh, this doesn't, uh, uh, this, uh, you, you have my full support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Adder um, and Senator Tina Mungi Barnes. Thank you, Osmosi, uh, Madam Chair, for giving me an opportunity to speak and um, say a few comments about the appointee. Um, first of all, Madam Chair, I'm going to have to disclose for the record that um, my identical twin sister, Donna Munya Kanata, who's in the audience right now, has a very close working relationship with Mr. Mendola. And because of that, we were our, our families were entwined with um, a meeting and knowing and just becoming close family uh, members uh, to our family. And I, I just want to to disclose that for the record because uh, as long as you were a student regent, a part of the University uh, of Guam's Board of Regents, I, I want to say that uh, my twin sister Donna um, really uh, talked highly about the work that you've done there, what you continue to do to promote and advocate for uh, for the culture uh, of our island and just being a family man and as I see your family and your children here just patiently um, waiting for you to complete this process uh, I will have to say that um, yesterday you gave me the opportunity to speak to you at length and I, I disclosed for you the biasness that I have in as far as what I believe should be the proper due process and uh, every man is innocent to their proven guilty I shared with you that working at the public defender's office for many years that's what I believe in my heart to be the right I, I, I shared with you that I don't profess to know at length region I uh, mean uh, title nine and, and what happens in Title IX and the procedures, but you did bring up to me that before I can make a just decision and a right decision as a parent representative, you said I must look at all the information that is before me. Not what everybody else is saying is what is presented. And I took that to heart yesterday, uh, Mr. Mark, because I said now I understand that what my twin sister said about you back then. I, I understand that when you were, I, I see um, former regents here like Dr. Leon Guerrero, Dr. Shimizu, um, when situations arose back then and it wasn't popular to what the administration was saying, you guys continued to stand your ground, you stood your ground, you made sure that the, the reasoning of why the decision was made by the board as a majority, you showed the pros and cons, we talked about that, 
and 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 you said that you know if it is at the will of the uh, appointing authority to release then then let it be but I make my decision based on what's presented and that's what I could say I appreciated about you because my sister had shared that in the past uh, I, I didn't know that she was coming in today uh, I want to thank her for being here because um, uh, you know just gives me um, a better understanding of of why you said you would vote your conscience based on what is that I I I'm coming to the conclusion, the true conclusion, that when you look at Title IX and you look at the due process and you look at all the information and, and the investiga uh, and investigating facts that need to come before you, before you make a decision, that all of that has to be in place. And I've got to believe that you understand that there is a checklist that you guys have to go through a board. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. So, so there should be, you know. Uh, a checklist of, of of what should happen in case this kind of information comes our way, and and uh, um, I'm just going to say that um, when confirmed by the board, uh, I mean when confirmed by this August body, that you continue to follow your heart, follow what's right by law. Do not assume that that whatever is said out there is going to be the choice that you're going to make based on on what is going out there in in public uh, courtrooms. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand. So, um, if you keep true to your heart, Mark, I, I I believe that that you will continue to be the best one of the best representatives because as a parent representative and having to go through what you've been going through and being fair and composed and honest about the situation, I want to say you have my vote. I think yesterday's conversation with me at length, uh, talking about the due process and talking about um, the information that is received before you made me better understand where you want to channel this and that I may be appointed, but I have to look at the evidence is what you, you shared with me. So um, continue that. And um, I, I want to thank everybody who did come out for you. It is not easy, you know. When you're up against public scrutiny, when it's, it's not easy. I understand. So uh, just thank you for stepping up to the plate during this, this really trying time and wanting to help make a difference, not just for the public school system, but for the island in general, because we have over, what, 40, 36,000 kids yes. in the public school system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Season you do one. have my support. Madam Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, speaker, yeah. thank you. I know we're really up against uh, time here. And, and Mark, I thank you very much for being here. And I did explain to you that we are not having a state funeral for the mayor at pass, but we are um, scheduled to be there at the church to present the official wreath and the flag uh, from the government of Guam. So please, all of you, ex excuse us for you know having to leave, to leave from early. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. So well. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Tina. So, um, Mark, just to <coughs> sum up, right, um, I certainly hope that the questions that you and I had already discussed during our conversation, that you don't view those as something that is intended to put you, your feet to the fire. The violation of Title IX, as noted by um, Vice Speaker, is serious. It's not just serious in terms of the fiscal impact to a, an educational institution. But it's quite serious relative to the welfare of our students. Title IX, and specifically within Title IX, that was actually passed into law in the 70s. They made an amendment um, recently, even in, in the 2000s, to include sexual harassment and sexual misconduct. And the reason for that is that students, they had viewed that if students are, are being bullied or being harassed, it may stand in the way for them to receive the equal opportunity to be educated because the environment 
is not conducive to learning. So that was why this whole issue of sexual harassment, sexual, um, sexual misconduct, or even sexual assault, if it is reported by a student, must be taken seriously. So the intent of Title IX is to protect the students, but it is also intended to provide a pathway for them to feel safe about reporting if they are violated, if they feel like they're being harassed by somebody who is in authority or even by uh, another student, that they would have that protection. So the procedures that you and I had discussed had to do with making sure that it's reported, they know that they, they know what their rights are, that they can report it to the authorities, and once it's reported, certain actions need to be taken right away, right? But the underlying purpose for Title IX is for the protection of our students from sexual harassment, from sexual discrimination based on um, even their sexual orientation. So given that, that you have really expressed, and I believe you, as Senator Torres had noted, that you have that authentic concern for students, and, and given that you are a father of five children, and knowing you, then I have that level of confidence that no matter what and what you have learned, that you are going to make those kinds of decisions that will be on behalf of our students and our educators. And that was primarily what this was intended to be, was to, for you to be able to explain to the public, to the community, that you have that level of commitment and that you have that courage to stand, to stand alone, even if you have to, on behalf of our students. And, and this certainly is taking a lot of courage because you are in an unclassified position and you've made it clear in your testimony here and in your conversation with me, and I believe also with the other centers, that if you have to make a decision, even if it means that it will cost you your livelihood, your job, you're going to stand firm on behalf of our students. So I really admire that of you. And I thank you very much for your patience. I thank you for the ongoing conversation. I hope that we can continue uh, to have conversations about any questions that you might have. Um, but, but certainly thank you for stepping up and I hope that you will have a conversation with Vice Speaker as well to give him the assurances I that you, you are really taking this yes. seriously. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. And so uh, with that, you certainly are, are now um, excused from the table. I will now call up uh, your supporters. I believe that there are those who have signed up. Thank you. Susu Smasi, Senators. Thank you very much. And so we have uh, Lou Lourdes uh, San Nicolas. We have um, um, Mr. Leon Guerrero, President Leon Guerrero. Uh, we we also have uh, Mr. Ben Menno. Uh, we have Ron McNinch. We have, okay, do we have enough seats? Lou, um, St. Nicholas. Okay, Dr. Leon Guerrero. And uh, Mr. Ben Menno. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll go ahead with uh, uh, Ms. St. Nicholas. Yes. Mr. Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz, Chairperson for Public Education, Senator Narissa Britannia Underwood, and Senator Mary Torres. As the Chairwoman for the Guam Education Board, and as a member of the Board, I come before you to express my support on the nomination of Mr. Mark Mindiola to the Guam Education Board as a parent representative. If confirmed, I am certain that Mr. Mindiola as a parent of students attending the Guam Public Schools, as a spouse of a classroom teacher, 
and a contributing member of our island community. He will fulfill his duties and responsibilities pursuant to 17 GCA Chapter 3 and 5 GCA Chapter 8. In addition, board policies do exist detailing what is expected of members of the Guam Education Board. I welcome his ideas, insights on how to strengthen the role of the board and how to support the Guam Department of Education in the 2020 vision for education on Guam. The 2020 vision for education on Guam is the state strategic plan that the board adopted on September 23, 2014. Mr. Mindiola's involvement and engagement in asking hard questions to determine what is, to what extent is the department meeting the goals and objectives is expected and to contribute to the successes of that plan. Mr. Mindiola will be mindful that oftentimes tough and challenging decisions would have to be made based on facts and not on gossips and rumors. He will make decisions independently and will place the students as the center and focus of his decisions. He will be respectful of the decisions of the majority, even if the decisions are different from his. I was inspired by my recent conversation with Mr. Mendiola, where he informed me on how his decisions will be based on his conscience and his commitment to be of service to the students in the public schools. Madam Chair and members of the Imina Chenta Chas Nahilisar Guahan Guam Legislature, I humbly ask for your support in confirming the appointment of Mr. Mark Mingola as the parent representative to the Guam Education Board. I look forward to working in partnership with Mr. Mendiola that will ultimately benefit the students in the Guam Public Schools. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in today's confirmation for Mr. Mark Mendiola. Buenas to all of you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nicholas. Mr. Mayno? Jesus Masi. Jesus Masi, Good morning. Matujo magi gwini ho saludam zo todos li mangai gwe nao itau tau ta gwini gi isla man man di pusita maulik na titanus maulik na tau tau hamzo na yadzo jatya nyen nyen gi na i faji na tiningo mijo u gai gi ja umet gud ina anu para mare pega papa gi Madili treya si bisentin meno tau tau nalahan mafanya gudzo anti di geria fanangwa ugini masamko lataja gwa sa gaga ya sinya du bamaila jataja gwi jagwa istranyo senere underwood we worked together you remember those times good times you were the head of the sat nine days and it was beautiful we done with a lot of difficulties, of course. I am here to say yes to Mark Mindiola. Jau nana nga eno, jau nana in eno, jau gaga gau gita hamdu, ni eno na, ni na sinya na minalago na in apreba. Sa hafa na hu apreba si matin, and met kulis gua hagi gua tu kita mau rubi lich tindakku. And met kulis aju nak tu met tindak. Lo pura tendang walu. Kata aja nama tau mamana. Unggan si senda bijak kulis gua nak ipun tu jelek nyai lo. Lo tajak gua. Lo ipun tu gini nai. Si moik mindiola. Si matin. Tiu tung wasi na tau tau. Lagi unsimana ni uli gigi cemoru village jag gua sulun gua gatu, pelawan English sulun jam apa lang ngayun, lekumatin, atau nasi region is cemoru village, esta gua apa lang ngayun, ispia jah unna gua haminau lek gua nak, taja dos oras matu iblak jam apa pega ni aji pun no unsulun, esin atau tau nai, hatungu omekungu, 
hatungo mangumprendi hatungo umusa idipotsi hapa pamatsogi gigidi gididi na tempo ni hutungo si martin adusia imangai gina man mambebindi itenda tenda ning kanu aji fast food sabi ne leliko istaba man mandidi bi pagu to dudu man mana papati ginen i direksionnya istaba ikemun justi wat di dusti libri ai mini tongnya lo ginen i direksionnya ginen i direksion i maulik na direksion si guru gua ha utimonya ginin guida ajuna lugar gua tu angino maulmo bula ne di mafananan manai gima homeless lo tisina na ita aturisa itau tau tana pu di homeless na nei tai gima au tai linga homeless is tai ling non ha lungu don hu tu gilo le masa pen man matu i turista i bisitar ta delnya ei ta gua guni kama si martin hana gas gas ajo bula pa besa ngon nyam tu pun si martin ajo na hu sos su tu ham tu ja tres tres senator you know where i'm coming from the three p to provide to protect and promote and that is his belief and my belief iho hongi iho angoku jahuga gaguna in kumprendi the by the way we have four more days for election i know it's gonna be very difficult and our blood is going to go up but rest assured you are in the people of Guam's mind for my final comment i've been an elected board of education before i encourage you madam chair senator bj cruz senator mary torres to put tons of money on the Title IX. We must send our board to NASBA and NADB to attend those conferences. That's the only way that you can ensure I was there. We do have at the University of Guam two individuals. Guahados Guini. Yau ningai ano parehu na panhano ibodjo matendia ju lanisita kancida na salapik. So na pasi kantila na sila P registration that you need to send all the board to ensure that your dream and your wishes and the protection. In addition, I'm going to ask my former judge, now a senator, to empower the equal employment opportunity that the President of the United States Executive Order 1112 and the executive order of the governor of Guam empower the civil service commission to give force so that the equal employment opportunity be strong in every government of Guam department because it's not working. You have questioned the sexual harassment. That is where the protocol, the process. That's my job when I was Working for the government of Guam, beside the Department of Education, she does mostly manana she does dispense do the bayanot go out to me tengu adios. Nangklu ne she does mostly Mr. Mena Senior. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I no, I have no question. Yeah, I'm oh. glad he was leaving. <laughs> I because I have to ask for everybody's indulgence. I wouldn't walk out on this meeting except for the fact that I have a commitment to students at JFK okay. at, at 11. So <laughs> please, it's not that I don't think this important, but I made a commitment to students. And yes. I hope you understand my uh, excusing myself at this point. I'm not going to the state funeral. I'm going to the 
students. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. You're excused. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. President. Am I on? Yes, you're on. I believe that's. that's Madam right. Chair Underwood, Senator um, Doris. My name is Wilfred P. Leonguero, President Emeritus of the University of Guam. I'm here endorsing and supporting the appointment of uh, Mr. Mark Mendiola to be a member of the Board of Education. I became acquaint acquainted with Mark when he served as Director of the University of Guam Endowment Foundation several years ago. I found Mark to be a good listener, respectful of other opinions, Mark has excellent communication skills and has good judgment. He has a knack for identifying issues when discussing situations. Mark knows the role of the board and will not interfere with the day-to-day -day operation of the department. He will, be, he will be an asset to the board. I highly recommend and urge that he be confirmed as a member of the Board of Education. And thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, yeah, you don't have any questions. Okay, uh, Dr. McMinch. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I believe we have Regent Shimizu and also Regent Kanata in the audience. Would they like to speak before me? Is this is a matter of protocol? Regent um, Shimizu, and we also have. Okay. Just a minute. And we have uh, Regent Kanata. Okay. By the way, uh, I would hope that these regents could be made Regent Emeritus at the university one day, certainly. Okay. We'll take that into consideration. Okay. So, um, Regent Kanata. I guess. Good morning. Good, mo good morning, Madam Chair. Let me move up here. <laughs> so close. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Today, uh, uh, I actually had something prepared, but uh, really, in, for me, it's just easier for me to talk about Mark from my heart. So, mm -hmm. just thank you for allowing me the opportunity, Senator Mary. Uh, thank you again for allowing us to be here. I come here to ask for your support in confirming Mark to the Board of Education. And I personally can say to you that I've worked with Mark. I've known Mark for over 19 years now. And when the, uh, when the University of Guam was going, to going through a very trying time, Mark was there to help us step up to the plate. When, um, when at the time, uh, Dr. Shimishu, who sat on the board with us, who was our chairperson, allowed us the opportunity he never clipped our wings. He, he made us speak our, our voices, and he made Mark and I work as hard as we could to promote the university, to make it the true gem of the mm -hmm. Pacific, the gem in our backyard. And if Mark could do that for the university, what more for the island of Guam and the Department of Education? Mark is a hardworking, honest man. He's God-fearing. He's an amazing husband. I know that. I, I, I've known them for many years with, with Jen. Uh, we attended their wedding. And I will say this to you. Mark was never afraid to take on any responsibility as far as uh, working on the different uh, board, uh, uh, committees and the, the committees that he chaired. And he also co-chaired the student alumni affairs with myself. And he was never afraid to, to uh, take on any challenges that was given to us. And the one thing that Mark had was that he was such a good listener and he took care of the students at the University of Guam. He was never afraid to bring it to the board. Mm -hmm. So, Madam Chair and, and Senator Mary, please, I hope that, you know, after considering all of our testimonies today, that only one thing comes out and it's a positive confirmation for Mr. Mandiola because I know that Mark will, will help push and, and, and fight for our students and, and, and all the students uh, of the Department of Education. He's a good, honest, hardworking man. Thank you. 
Thank you very, very much, Ms. Kanata. Okay, uh, Regent Dr. Shimizu. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Torres, it's nice to see you. Um, I know it's a very busy morning and there's a lot of people here that um, I'm, I'm assuming will or to support uh, Mark. Um, I don't give my uh, recommendations very easily um, when anyone asks, unless I know uh, the person, because my name is behind that person. And I, you know, for whatever reason, uh, I love my name. <laughs> That's all that I have. You're, you're, uh, a person is only as good as their name, not the material things, not the power, the earthly powers that we have, whether it is to govern an island, whether it is to be another branch of government, to have oversight uh, uh, and have that uh, a power, um, whether it is the Board of Education uh, who is governed uh, as a governing board, uh, but it's going through a tremendous amount of, of turmoil. It's been going on for a long time. It's growing. It's one of the biggest agency in the government while providing services to our families, not only our children, not only for our future, but here and now. And I, I, I spoke with Mark. I called Mark. I said, Mark, I need to talk to you um, because you've asked me to to um, support your nomination, but we need to talk. I have no, uh, 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 I have no uh, uh, disagreement in terms of Mark's capacity and, and capability of being on a governing board. I've seen him. I've seen him grown as a student. I knew Mark before he got married. I knew Mark before he had five boys, enough for a basketball team. Yeah, and, and, and they're good-looking boys. And, and, and I see Mark's um, uh, as, as a father. To, he, he takes great pride and really interest and seriousness of raising the five boys and, of course, his lovely wife. When I met with Mark, my, my comments to him was, Mark, you're entering into an area that is so turmoil. It, it would you know, a sign of leadership, a good captain, is not when the waters are calm. Never when the waters are calm. And chao chao itasi, kumolo i kapitan. Imaulig na kapitan. When the waters are rough, you will emerge as a captain to take the ship in safely. Mark is a good candidate for this type of chow chow, for this type of rough seas. He has proven himself, at least to me, when we had our share of rough waters at the University of Guam. As chairman, I let every individual region make their own decision. I try not to, to influence them or pressure them because of the power of the chair. Power is very fleeting. I said, Mark, it's rough waters. You're going to be challenged by some of the powers of all those areas I've said. In the head of state, in the policy, and in the board. You're going to have to dig down deep inside and accept the consequences of your actions. Because we have seen the consequences of actions of other board members. And that is why we're here today. The consequences. And they accepted it. They accepted the consequences of their decision. And I want to commend those former appointed board members. I really do. 
this is not the reality show of Trump, you're fired. I told him that. The power of the governor to appoint you, appreciate that power, it is a very precious thing to be appointed by the governor. It's equally precious for this legislature to understand and not also say, well, you know, your decisions may be colored. People are asking this question because you're an unclassified, because you, what, what, all of those things, Mark, are going to be brought out. And it's, that's the rights of fire. That's what we do here. We deliberate. We ask every question about you. You are now in the public realm. But make sure that you understand the consequences of your decision. You must make those decisions in the best interest of your five boys who symbolize the 30,000. Really, it's, it's, a, a, it's a, a very uh, rough waters. And senators, I ask you to support them. I've seen what, you know, the, the, the issues that goes back and forth. But that's part of the job. Never lose sight of that ball. Never lose sight. Mark, never lose sight, no matter what. Now, will you be willing to sacrifice that maybe not only will you be asked to, to resign, but maybe you're also your own employment, you're unclassified. Are you willing to put yourself in harm's way? I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but I'm sure it's in the minds of, of everybody asking that question. I waited for his response. If your job is on the line, what would you do, Mark? What would you do? Because that's really hard when you're talking about bread and butter of the family. I, I don't know what the economic situation is of the other board members. But you know what? This is just a labor of love to be on this board. <laughs> it is, it's, uh, you, you, we should be thanking Mark and Dr. Magnitch. Thank you very much to go into rough waters. Because sometimes the boats sink. And sometimes crew members drown. So I want to thank both of them. Mark's answer to me was, Dr. Shimizu, I, I know that. I understand that. I said, what would you do if there is a policy differences between you and the governor or the chairwoman of education or your board members? What would you do Will you do what the governor wants? I would assume that as long as it's compatible with his principles. What would you do if the chairwoman or the legislature say, we, don't, we want you to go this way? What would you do? If it's good input, then I would uh, make my decision based on my principle. Same thing with the governing board. So it all came down to me to say, yes, Mark, I will come down. I'll come down from the Bokongo because I'm, I'm, I don't go out as much. I'm happy to be here to support uh, Mark Mendiola's uh, nomination based on his answer. His answer that his principle will prevail, notwithstanding any consequences for not only from Adelope or from this body or from the uh, governing board. But we must know that there are consequences and you, I know because I've gone through that. But you know, your name and principle is the most important. And Mark has that and I said, yes, I will come. 
In fact, I had to go somewhere, but I, I had to come back again to let you know that Mark is a man of principle. If he needs support to uphold that principle, Mark, for whatever it's worth, my name is with you, and I will be there. If you have any doubts, if you feel any pressure, and you need someone to talk to like you've always had done before, I am always there for you. Thank you very much. And I must Thank leave. Thank you very much. Unless you have any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Shimizu. Okay. Yes, I'm a bright speaker. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, Dr. McPinch, and, um, and then I'll go ahead and call up the others before you start. Um, thank you, Ms. Kanata. Okay, so we also have uh, Jesse Leon Guerrero. Uh, it's just written, or did Jesse Leon Guerrero? Okay. Uh, Don Platt, Dr. Don Platt. Uh, we have uh, Enrique Torres. And Peter Alexis Ada, and I think Dr. Jensen, we can also, if you want to bring up your chair, that would then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. McNinch, you can start. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Ron McNinch. I work at the University of Guam, and I'm very pleased to say that Mark was my student for, for several years. I've known Mark for oh, Mark Mendiola for over uh, maybe 17 years, and uh, he was a, a wonderful student, and I've known him also on a personal level after he graduated. Uh, I also attended Mark's wedding with my wife and daughter, and uh, my daughter, who was a kindergarten student at the time, exclaimed that uh, Jennifer uh, looked just like a princess. So, I, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, every young girl has princesses as their role model, certainly. Uh, Mark was an excellent MPA student in my program. Uh, he was a student regent. He was a teacher at Tinian. I visited him when he was in Tinian as a teacher. He was a very enthusiastic and a great role model as a teacher. When he was in my MPA program, uh, he studied politics. He studied government. And one of his uh, great encounters he shared with me was his experiences with Mr. Larry Ramirez and how Mr. Ramirez had taught him a lot about how grassroots politics and grassroots government works. And uh, certainly uh, also Mark is a uh, proponent and, and strong advocate, positive role model for the Chamorro culture also. And he was a Boy Scout executive. And so he's got all these neat, and in addition to being a parent and uh, PTO member and having great government experience. So he has quite a number of good, uh, good solid bases to be on, on this particular board. I have two general observations on this board to make briefly. First, it's the biggest budget item in the government of Guam. It's the highest pressure of pretty much any board on Guam. And yet, the board members hardly get any pay at all. Uh, if, if a person is going to be on this board, they're going to have to do it as a labor of love because certainly the compensation isn't even close to any other board other than probably the Civil Service Commission. The other observation is this board, the Board of Education, needs a full-time attorney, a person that they can rely on as a board to help them with critical questions and critical problems. And not an ad hoc AG who's kind of sort of you know, doesn't view their role as education. They need a, a designated education attorney to serve the board and probably the greater Department of Education. And I say that using my public administration hat. And the reason is there's a formula for public board service, whether it's nonprofit boards or government boards. And the formula is very simple. First, read and understand the law. You have to read the law of the agency. You have to read and understand the 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 boundaries, the rules of the agency. And that includes the behavior of commissioners and board members and also other assorted related laws that are pertinent to the agency. 
Second, you have to read the rules, regulations, and procedures of the agency and understand them and, and be familiar with them and be willing in both of those cases to admit if you don't understand it, you need to be willing to admit it and mitigate it and fix it and, and get your knowledge up to that point. Uh, the third point is you follow the laws and rules. And, and by the way, under, under the related rules, you also have to know your stakeholders and understand those boundaries. And then fi finally, you base your decisions on the principles of following the law and following the best practice. I have to say that I've known Mark Mendiola for 17 years, and he's been not only experienced in doing this, he's been trained to do this. And he has my full faith and confidence in doing this job as a board member. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, on December 2nd, my students are having a little conference on Title IX, Title VII, the Cleary Act, uh, and the Guam Whistleblower Act. And we're doing this as, as a public service, and we're certainly going to invite uh, anyone from the public or board members or members of the community possible to join us. The key thing we all need to admit as a community is we constantly have to develop and, and, and enrich our skills if we're going to be on these critical boards. We don't know it all. Even if we've had experience with education for 20 or 30 years, we constantly have to update our skills and, and, and understanding of things. And the reason is law changes. You know, the, the symbol of the law is the turtle. And, and if you go to the U.S. Supreme Court, there are turtles everywhere. That's because justice is slow. The key thing is uh, our laws constantly emerge, and because of that reason, our board members need to constantly develop their skills. Mark has my full faith and confidence, and I'm certainly pleased to be here today. Uh, and, uh, and seeing his family now, many years later, he has a full family. Um, so very pleased uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. You are. Yes, hello. Hello. Oh, whoa. Hello. <laughs> okay. Yes. Excellent speaker. Good morning, Senators. I'm Dr. Donald L. Platt, uh, professor of history at the University of Guam and also president of our faculty union. I've been at the university for 28 and a half years. I think there's only about four or five people that have been there longer. And out of those 28 and a half years, I've been involved with the union board for about 20 of those 28 years as president 16 this is my 16th year and uh, I got to know Mark uh, shortly after I became union president because he was chosen as a student regent so in the 16 years I've been union president I've been able to serve with several of the student regents and Mark is the best uh, they have had in all the years I've been involved with it I don't know about before but when I was involved uh, no one has come up to Mark's abilities on the Board of Regents he was actively involved in all the discussions. I've attended every board meeting since being union president and many sub, uh, most of the subcommittee meetings. And he was actively involved in those. The students that have followed him pretty much stay silent during the committee meetings and the general board. But Mark, his maturity was very noticeable. His uh, ability to articulate his positions, uh, the active role he took was very impressive. And that was at a time that the university was in what I call the dark ages. Uh, from June 1996 to December of 2000, the university had reached a low point uh, through the most incompetent administration you'd ever want to see at a university. And Mark came in at that period. I was elected at that period, a real challenge. So if they think the issues with the education board are a challenge now, he's been through that already, a very challenging time. And with the support of Mark on the board, of David Shimizu, who just spoke, of Donna Munya Kanata, of Marie Nelson, of the late John Beamer, we were able to keep politics out of future presidential searches. Uh, mainly thank, especially to the Regents Nominating Council. Thank you, Senator Wampat, for that, and Dr. Jensen uh, for creating it, because that has to be one of the best reforms ever implemented in Gov Guam took politics out of the choosing the president. We've had several. I've been, I'm the only person on the island who's been in the last four consecutive presidential searches. Each one got better and better. The first, a disaster. But the second one, Mark was involved in that. And they've gotten better since then. So, uh, in fact, they were sued uh, because they didn't do what they were supposed to from Adeloupe. And that case was thrown out. 
it was not successful. So he's used to that kind of pressure, and he dealt with it very well. And uh, I can't stress enough uh, what an excellent choice this is to be on the board. Um, and then, of course, there's his experience of being with the Boy Scouts, uh, serving on the endowment fund for UOG. I think President Fred, is he still here? He's gone. <laughs> mentioned that so uh, everyone will say a lot of positive things about him uh, I'm just I can't remember it's been see 15 17 years ago I was here quite a lot <laughs> for in things around the university will the senators hear our oral testimony will they see videotapes of it or is it just the written testimony oh it's transcribed oh good okay okay excellent uh, well I can't say of uh, much more he's just an excellent choice I can see him the questions that were asked earlier about what would he do in this situation um, having seen Mark work on the Board of Regents I know that he'll hit the ground running and he will get the policy mail so see what the rules are and he will make sure we got to follow this 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 and this and do it right uh, he has integrity honesty and that's what we need on that board integrity is very important and honesty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Platt. And so we have Mr. Torres. Good morning, Madam Speaker Juan Pat, Senator Narissa Britannia Underwood, Chairperson for the Committee, and other Senators and the people of Guam. Thank you for the opportunity to hear my testimony for your consideration in favor of confirming Mr. Mark Mendiola's appointment to the Guam Education Board. I'm going to give you an, um, my uh, experiences with Mark in a nonprofit organization, which also adheres to a lot of compliances. The Boy Scouts of America has, has been through a lot of turmoils, especially with uh, sexual abuse. I am Enrique Torres, an Eagle Scout, a former district executive for the Chamorro District Aloha Council with the Boy Scouts of America, and a former Scout Master. I had the privilege of joining Mark in the development of leadership skills for young, young Scouts throughout our island from 2005 through 2009. I want to first thank Mr. Mark Mendiola for his de uh, directorship of the local scouting program and the mentorship of Eagle Scouts and other scouts and their leaders. Also, for the proper management pro program implementation and leader leadership training for the district during his tenure as a district executive. It was through his leadership with guidance from the district committee, which is comprised of um, stakeholders, business, uh, business managers, CEOs, and other, um, other uh, dignified dig uh, people with digni uh, dignified service. It was through his leadership with guidance from the district committee that island-wide scouting events, summer camps, were safe and goal-oriented. Mr. Mendiola received training from the National Executive Institute of the Boy Scouts of America and various training useful youth development programs. With his training in youth protection, Mark was unflinching in enforcing two too deep adult leadership at all levels of youth and to adult encounters, either at home meetings, campouts, hikes, or ev other events. This is a directive by the National Office of the Boy Scouts of America, screen screening of known child molesters, bully awareness and, pre uh, and prevention, child abuse reporting, and are explicit and regulated in this policy. Mr. Mindyola's knowledge and experience in youth development will provide the current Guam Board of, of uh, Education Board with expected scrutiny in achieving a safe learning environment for students bringing relief and peace of mind for their parents or guardians. Additionally, Mark will be able to incorporate achievement-oriented goals adaptable from the scouting program for the board's consideration and implementation in DOE's current curriculum and instruction. Mark understands the importance of personal growth, 
establishing principles and character development as they relate to early childhood and youth development. Mr. Mark Mendiola is an exemplary leader having compelling youth development trainings and experiences. His service, integrity, contribution, sacrifice, responsibility, and most impo importantly, his loyalty to pu pupils, students, parents, and teachers will make his membership in the Guam Education Board logical yet pertinent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Torres. Um, now we have Dr. Chanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a few things to uh, add or mostly to reiterate of what the, uh, some of the previous speakers have said. Uh, Mr. Mandiola is a man of solid integrity and um, sterling character. And it was uh, my privilege to see him in action as a young man at, uh, 15 years ago as a member of the uh, Board of Regents um, who stepped in alongside the other uh, courageous members of that uh, board who and at a time uh, when they were under enormous pressure uh, to um, uh, knuckle under to pol <coughs> excuse me political pressure they um, they followed their conscience and they did what was right for the university and the people of Guam um, Mr. Mandiola was uh, an instrumental part of the uh, leadership of the board and the combination of faculty leadership at the time that that uh, rallied and worked with the members of the 26th legislature that put together the um, the uh, region nominating council and the uh, university faculty senate uh, institutions which have uh, played an instrumental role in putting the university on the trajectory that it continues on to to this day. Um, he uh, was, uh, a, a, as a young man, showed the qualities that uh, he continues to uh, show, and I've always seen him as one of the uh, up-and-coming leaders in the community uh, here, and uh, he has my um, full respect for taking on this uh, appointment at a, at a time when he's coming into a, a very uh, uh, difficult time for the board that he's stepping up to. Uh, I think he's uh, demonstrated that he's, he's the man for the job <laughs> and, and uh, he will uh, provide the kind of uh, integrity and kind of moral leadership that, uh, that our community uh, needs at this, at this time. So it's my pleasure to endorse him. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Jensen and Mr. Adler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, uh, Senator Torres, good morning to all of you. When Mark walked up here or sat down here and he began his talk and he said exactly all his background of I sat back there and I said, I've been there and I've done that. I was the president of the respective schools where my children went to school. I was the president of the parent teachers organization or the island wide. And then I was appointed as an ex, uh, I was a participant of the ex officio member of the Board of Education, then appointed, then elected. So I know exactly what Mark is talking about. Mark this morning introduced me to five of his children. I said, my gosh, they got a good basketball team. The M&M team. What was also interesting is that Mark introduced me to his wife and if I heard it correctly, she's a teacher at Tizen, a 
think music, math, oh, sorry. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, that's good because we would like to see additional emphasis with vocational education and career education. I really am I'm hoping that we'll be able to see more uh, push into this area. It is pretty clear, based from the couple of weeks of events, that the current Board of Education is at a standstill. Nothing is uh, pretty clear. Nothing is going to happen before January. Ladies, and to those that are absent, that's too long. I'm asking you, please consider, once the second nominee has been uh, presented to, the, to your committee, if it takes a special session, please do it. We've got to move forward with education. I'm not saying it's at a stand, the education is at a standstill. It's the leadership is what I'm talking about. Mark, when I was talking with him, said something that really struck me. And it was a very simple word. He said he had a child with special needs. That's what the board also needs. Someone who's walked that path. Mr. Mendiola hearing everybody talk, my only opportunity with Mr. Mendiola to really talk with him or know a little more about him is at FESPAC. And he was a very articulate in his uh, presentation to the board. And um, when we talk about the, uh, you, uh, Senator Underwood, you were talking about the payment. I was the one who brought that up. Um, but at the same token, um, I did ask, what's the cause of this? And the billing that we got or the Department of Education got was for one month. I don't know who made the ask the question because yes, Mark was present when they said we will pay for the utilities, or the utilities including water usage, but we will pay only for that period that we use it. The bill that came was for a whole month. So I did ask um, our business office, uh, send it, uh, figure it out. Let them pay for their two months bill. Uh, two weeks, I'm sorry, two weeks usage. So in short, uh, ladies, uh, senators, Madam Speaker, I stand, be I sit before you, come before you in full support and ask you for your endorsement. And approval for Mr. Mark Mendiola to sit on the Board of Education. And I'm going to again reiterate what I just finished saying a few seconds ago. Once you get the second name of Dr. McNitch and you've done your public hearing, um, I'd like to ask you to please consider a special session to address this issue so we can move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ada. Um, we know, I think we've exhausted the list. We have gone through everyone who have signed up. And is there anyone else who would like to give testimony? Yes, please come up, Mr. Petit. Good morning. Morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak on uh, Mr. Mignola's behalf. Uh, I met Mark Mignola about three years ago uh, when his son was coming up to Agatha Johnson. 
and he kind of explained some some of the issues this young man had at his previous school and I assured him then that that would not take place uh, under my leadership as a principal um, and my name is James Petit, the principal of Augusta Johnson okay so you know with that said we talked for about an hour and I began to understand uh, you know some of his concern and I think that anybody in this room who is associated with education has those same concerns especially about the most at-risk students that we have in our department um, I believe he'll be an asset to, to the Education Board. Uh, he has extensive knowledge uh, about operations and what he needs to do to move things forward. Obviously, he's a very successful businessman. Uh, he has a uh, shop at the uh, night market. Um, I believe that he will not be persuaded by misinformation or misguided. Uh, and I think that people have have articulated that uh, regarding Mark because he is a very principled person. He will stand by his conscience. Uh, and I think that when he makes a decision, the most important thing he sees is his children. But that, 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 that perspective extends uh, to all kids in DOE. And I truly believe that he will be a, a wonderful asset and he'll bring uh, you know, some stability that we've all talked about. But I think he'll bring a perspective of, of a parent who's intimately involved with everything that his children do uh, he has a wonderful wife that supports him in everything um, I work with Mark during Feshback because Augusta Johnson was one of the host schools you know and all of us at that time at the very very beginning we were working like 20 hour days making sure that our guests were, were properly taken care of uh, this was a wonderful honor to be part of this process uh, so you know I saw Mark at various hours in the afternoon in the wee hours of the morning because myself I would be there uh, at times so I asked him, I said, uh, you know, when was the last time you slept? So he kind of made a joke, hey, what's that? So retaining a sense of humor, right, in a situation that is tumultuous at times and very, very demanding, uh, I think that that streaks of his character uh, when it comes to difficult situations and, and getting, having that, that determination to get things done. Uh, one of the main reasons I'm here, though, is uh, Mr. Mendiola. I actually coerced him into being my PTO president two years ago. Uh, I saw the wonderful qualities he had, the way he, he treated his children, the way he, uh, he demanded that excellence, not only from me as a principal, uh, but from my teachers as well who service his child. Uh, and he has been nothing but a supporter of Augata Johnson as a PTO president. He's, he's done some wonderful things uh, with Augata. Uh, we got some more community support because of some of the things that he's done. Uh, and we're going to continue to move that ball forward. So uh, as the principal of Augusta Johnson, I highly recommend that uh, you know, he, he would be confirmed. Um, another thing that they do is uh, on Monday, the 7th of November, uh, the PTO is going to be rewarding student behavior, uh, our PBIS assembly we're going to have. Uh, the board, the PTO board, uh, has uh, graciously uh, donated uh, three bikes, one for every grade level student who gets selected uh, as being uh, the most improved or whose name gets pulled out of this box. But, uh, Mark Mendola is an excellent asset to uh, uh, the Guam Education Policy Board, and I know that he'll do a wonderful job. And I truly appreciate uh, your, your allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petit. Yes, Pika, please come up. State your name for the record. Hafere, Naan Husi Pika Farin. Sijiswasi Pare Tempo Mitsu. Um, I come before you today, full disclosure, Mark Mendiola is married to my first cousin. So I have known him a very long time. Um, I have not had the opportunity to work with him, but um, being present today, I've um, really heard from those that have, and um, I truly admire that. I've also been, you know, um, as a family member, been watching him through all the different positions that he has taken, and I would say I, I admire him. and. Um, you know, we were, uh, we were both, uh, I guess, nominated or appointed to the Board of Education together, and we were on that bus together, um, and he called me, and the first thing he told me was, Pico, we're going to do this, we're going to go in there, and we're going to make sure that things are being done right, in the right way for the truth. Um, and unfortunately, I had to jump off that bus with him um, to maintain my position with the Tomorrowland Trust. But I, I fully um, support Mark, and I believe, and I know his heart is in the wrong place, uh, in the right place with his character. Um, so thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Speaker. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, Mark, thank you again uh, for stepping up and uh, accepting the nomination. And you certainly have the support. You, the centers have stated their support for you, and you certainly have my support. I uh, thank you for reaching out and for us to have candid conversation. And um, I also thank you that uh, you have uh, expressed your, your routine, that every morning you pray, and you pray for your family and, and for the community. I appreciate that. So with that, um, uh, Sijulis Maasi, for all of your testimonies. Uh, there being no additional individuals to present any more testimony, the public hearing on the appointment of Mr. Mark Benny C. Mendiola to the Guam Education Board is now concluded. The committee will continue to accept testimony until 5 p.m. Monday, November 14, 2016. Uh, testimonies may be submitted to the Guam Legislature, 155 Hessler Place, Hagatnia, Guam, via email at james.servino at guamlegislature.org or via fax at 671-969-0975. The public hearing is now adjourned, and it is 11.08 a.m. Thank you.